Hello, and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Wasteless Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has a goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoors starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. In episode 78 of the Outdoor Minimalist podcast, we return to some of the seven R's of outdoor minimalism, rehome and repurpose. If you listened to some of our earliest episodes, then you may be familiar with some of them, but if you haven't heard those episodes or read the book, the seven R's of outdoor minimalism include reduce, refuse, rethink, repair, rehome and repurpose, remove, and restore. So in this episode, we are focusing on the fifth R, which is rehome and repurpose combined together. These two are grouped together because by the time we get to the point in our gear's life where it no longer serves us, we have a few choices that we can make. We can throw it away, we can recycle it, we can repurpose it. However, sometimes our gear is still fully functional by the time we're done using it, which is why rehoming comes into play. So both rehoming and repurposing have the intended purpose to give the gear a new life and divert it from the landfill. To help give us some perspective and some new ideas on repurposing, I had the pleasure of interviewing Martin Armitage, AKA Papa Bear Hikes. Martin has a lifetime of outdoor experiences, including over two decades as a Boy Scout volunteer and recipient of the Whitney Young Jr. Award, the host of the globally popular podcast, Papa Bear Hikes. Martin has combined his love for the outdoors with his background in online education to create an inspirational and informative program with diverse guests sharing a variety of outdoor topics from travel to outdoor adventures. Martin is also the author of Switching Gears, Rediscovering the Meaning of Life, Love, and Happiness While Backpacking Vermont's Long Trail. So thanks for joining me on the show, Martin. This is kind of fun because it's kind of like a full circle for us because Martin interviewed me on his podcast, Papa Bear Hikes, before the Outdoor Minimalist, Minimalist podcast was even published. So here now I get to interview you, which is awesome. Um, and the first question that I ask all of my guests is just kind of a little bit with their background in outdoor recreation, how they got involved, um, and what they like to do on a daily basis outside. Well, my background in outdoor recreation goes back over 50 years when I was seven years old and went on my first backpacking trip. And that was it. I was bit with the outdoor bug from there. I grew up in northern New Jersey outside of New York City. So when my father took me on a backpacking trip up the Sunfish Pond in 1972, we went on a section of the Appalachian Trail. And people that have hiked the Appalachian Trail are familiar with Sunfish Pond. And we approached the sun, we approached the Appalachian Trail, we started seeing white blazes. And my father explained to me about this trail and that it went from Georgia all the way up to Maine. And from there, yeah, I was just taken in and wanted to know more about it. And over the years, backpacking was pretty much my first love in the outdoors. But since then, I've gotten into paddle sports. Recently, I've gotten back into uh, biking. I've been doing, and as my, when my kids grew up, I started doing multi-week, multi-week backpacking trips. In fact, I wrote a book about my trip, my long trail hike up in um, New Hampshire. And yeah, I my outdoor experiences go yeah, or go far and long. And I was a scout leader for over 20 years, uh, a volunteer with the Boy Scouts of America, where it's, which again, just kind of fueled my love of the outdoors even more because I was able to share it with other people. And the podcast, it, for the same reason, it just gave me that opportunity to share something I have so much passion for. And and you know, Meg, that when you have a passion for something, you love talking about it and sharing it with other people. Absolutely. And that's kind of why I feel like you're a perfect person for this topic, because we've talked about maintaining gear and the importance of repairing and repurposing gear and all that stuff is very core to outdoor minimalism and all that stuff. And people have talked about it on the show. Um, So it is nice to hear from someone that has like such a long history um, because you grew up with different gear than even I grew up with. And so kind of like your exposure to repair and repurposing is much different perspective wise than mine. So I'm excited to hear a little bit more 
about that. And if you're okay with it, we can just kind of like jump right into the topic. And yes, sounds good. <laughs> just start by um, maybe talking about some of the benefits um, and why we should take the time to actually do that with our gear. Well, the biggest benefit I could think of is money. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I had a part-time job after school, saved up and bought my first backpacking stove and then some other pieces of gear. And I knew how hard I worked to come up with the money to buy that gear. And I wanted to take care of it. And I started a habit at that age of saying, all right, I'm going to use every piece of gear as long as I can, because we work hard for the things we have, especially if we buy quality items. Well, I reached a point where I had a backpack. It was an old canvas backpack. It was on a, one of those heavier aluminum frames. And it was done. It had, it had pretty much lived its life. But I looked at it and said, there has to be something else that could be done with this. There was some dry rot in the canvas and some tears in it. So I, I do what I now, over the years, refer to as I dissected it. I went through it took the pack off the frame and said, okay, well, this frame can still be used because I have friends that backpack with me that, you know, maybe we can tie their sleeping bags to it and some tents and have more room in my backpack to carry some of their gear. That was, so I repurposed the frame and then I looked at it even further and I said, well, you know, there's buckles on here and there's a, a couple other little things. And I took those off and I said, you know, I can use these somewhere else to repair something or even make another piece of gear. And I did that those ethics kind of stayed with me. And before there was any such thing as leave no trace, uh, yeah, I had it in my mind. You you need to make things live as long as you can. You need to take these items and stretch their lifespan out as long as we possibly can. I grew like I said, I grew up outside of New York City. From the town I grew up in, my hometown, there were garbage dumps. The schools I went through, my 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 high school, my K through eight, you could see the garbage dumps from our school. And that was something that really bothered me. And it always stuck in my head. There has, there has to be something we can do to address this. What, what can we do as individuals to reduce the amount that's going into landfills? So for the context of what we're doing here with backpacking gear, that's where I started it. Every gear, I, every piece of gear I ever had. And I use my stuff until it is done, done. I am not somebody that says, hey, you know what? I think I want to get a new flashy backpack. Let me go buy it. I wait until it's ready to go to the grave. And even before it goes in the grave, I take everything I can off of it and look for other ways to use the pieces that aren't worn out or broken. Yeah. So I guess, how do you kind of make those decisions? How do you decide something is like done, done versus like something that can be um, repurposed into something new? Well, one of my favorite things, and I keep going to the backpack because I think that that is the piece of equipment that we can really, that really is the most versatile for, as far as items that are on it that we could take off and, and repurpose. Some backpacks, especially the external frame ones, have pockets on them. I have cut around pockets. I've taken them and I actually will very carefully cut around them. I don't sew. So to avoid going to somebody and asking them to sew something for me, I cut around it very neatly. And then I end up with a nice little stuff sack. Um, water bottle pockets, the same thing, especially for winter. I have an older backpack that I um, the frame had broke. I didn't buy it. It wasn't mine. I, and again, I'm a, I am don't want to use the word hoarder, but well, maybe I am. We were, I was up at Cornell university. We had taken the kids up there for an activity and another scout leader who is of the same mindset of ISIS as, as I am says, Hey, come over and look at this. They got a box of stuff that they're giving away. And we went through it and they said, Oh, look, there's tent poles in here. And there's, there's this broken backpack. I could do things with this. So yeah, I took that home and uh, one of the things I was able to get off of that was this water pot, water bottle pocket that was insulated that I can now use for winter hiking to keep my water bottle from freezing. Just the right size to fit an algae and bottle in. Uh, the other things, you know, old backpacks that have the brains on them, the lids, those um, the internal frame packs. I made a fanny pack out of one of those. I was able to take it. The rest of the pack was shot except for some buckles. And I was able to find a way to put a two inch belt through it and turn it into a fanny pack. I've also used it on my frameless backpack that doesn't have a lid and I can even strap it down to the sides of that. So it gives me some extra storage. Something I always do with pieces of gear, things that break all the time. And this probably goes back to being a scout leader, buckles, right? Kids are always coming to me The buckle broke on my backpack or on this or that. So at one time I had 
and literally had a two gallon bucket filled up with uh, a variety of belt buckles and the little plastic keepers for the straps and everything. So it, yeah, I, I just don't believe anything could just be randomly thrown in the garbage. Yeah, it's really interesting um, to hear you talk about it and to hear you say that you don't sew because um, a lot of the things I guess that I have done with gear involve sewing. So your approach seems a lot more accessible because you don't necessarily need to learn like a brand new um, skill, you know what I mean? Or even have mm -hmm. as much equipment. You don't need to have a sewing machine. You don't need to have um, even really like a big sewing kit. Um, so what were some other examples like beyond just a backpack of things that you have maybe worked on in the past? Well, something I was able to do because I have somebody in my life who does so, and I will, I don't want to go to that well too many times, but had an old sleeping bag and had somebody make booties out of them. All right. The bag, it was torn and the uh, fill was coming out of it. And again, I looked at that and said, you know, this, something could be done with this. So I found a pattern online uh, to make booties of, of making, uh, and I, I'm trying to think of the best way to uh, describe this, but yeah, they're just like down booties that you put on, I use them put on my feet in the winter time or in the colder weather when I get into my sleeping bag, just because I have, my feet tend to get cold in my sleeping bag. Uh, and then from that, making hoods out of it again for sleeping yeah to kind of just i guess it kind of also is a good way to um extend the life of like current equipment that you have or like preventing from having to invest in other equipment because i've done it before where i have a really old sleeping bag and i don't have like a cold weather sleeping bag and so i'll like put two sleeping bags together <laughs> Yeah. And oh, it's I, not I, I have that the most too. effective, but it has worked in a pinch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was on a uh, camping trip in the Catskills a couple of years ago. It was October and it could get pretty cold. It was uh, Halloween. We decided to do a night hike at Halloween. And yeah, my 30 degree sleeping bag isn't quite as warm at 30 degrees as it once was. It's, I think, now 14 years old. So I have an out, another bag that's it's a bigger, it's a larger bag that I picked up at Camp Moore. It was returned and somebody else had used it but yeah i have it i used to use it as like a really hot weather bag but i'm able to put my down bag inside of that and get some extra insulation for for sleeping one thing that i'm wondering because it's something that i have heard other people um say and talk about is sometimes they'll go to like garage sales or like um outlet store or not outlet stores but like yeah, garage sales is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, consignment stores, that was what I was thinking of. Um, and they'll like find gear that is no longer like functional in its original sense. And then they'll repair it or repurpose it then. Have you ever done anything like that oh, to save oh, money? Yeah. It's a good way to save money and also learn how to do these things. Oh, yeah. I picked up a couple of external frame backpacks last year that somebody was selling on Mar um, Facebook Marketplace. And he was selling them for $5 each. They were really old. And I, I'm looking and trying to decide which one I want to buy. And he says, you know what? I'll let you have them both for $5. And I was like, wow, I get in the car and I tell my wife, wow, look what I got. They're both two of them for $5. She goes, oh, they look like, they look horrible. You know, what are you going to do with something like that? I said, you wait and see what I do with this. Some of the pins were broken on them. They were just dirty. They were, they were uh, there was a broken strap. It became a project. I had them both fixed up and looking great. They don't look brand new, but they are functional now. That's awesome. I just wonder, because sometimes I think sometimes maybe people get overwhelmed. I know that I do this sometimes or I'll have like, kind of like, I'll save stuff, you know, and that's kind of like maybe where the hoarder thing comes into mm -hmm. play what, what you're talking about, or is like, I have something that obviously isn't working anymore, but I save it because I was like, I can probably do something with it someday. So how do you come up with the ideas for your repurposing projects? Well, there's a joke in my house. My wife, I always say, you know, you, you kind of look at everything as what else can I do with this? Uh, for example, you know, you got those mesh sacks that like garlic will come in or shallots or even onions. And I'll say, oh yeah, let me have that when you're finished with it. I, that, you know, I could use that for like a stuff sack or I've used those to put wet clothes on and attach to the back of my pack. But yeah, how do you stop yourself from crossing that line where you just like everything you come across is now starting to take over and, and, and it's tough for me it is like i said I, I struggle with throwing things away when i just i, I look at it and say, I, I if i just think hard enough maybe i'll come up with with something to do with that but uh i know when i when i was 
finished as a volunteer with the Boy Scouts. I ended up donating a bunch of stuff there, th things that they could use to repair. Uh, but yeah, you have to be careful not to cross that line. You know, you have to be able to know when to walk away. I probably could have very easily spent weeks tempted to looking at stuff on Facebook marketplaces to, to be able to revive, to bring back the life. Yeah. Every once in a while I catch myself, I'm just kind of like scrolling on there, looking at gear. I was like, Oh, I could probably do something with that. But I was like, do I actually need that? No, I just want something to do. <laughs> well, that's what happened to me. I'd hiked in the Adirondacks and in the Adirondacks, you required to carry a bear canister. And the bear canister, I really struggled to get to fit my backpack, my frameless backpack. And it wasn't very comfortable because it kind of put me over that threshold of the of a comfortable weight in my backpack. And then I thought, well, if I got an external pack, external frame pack, I can strap the bear canister to the bottom of it. Yeah, and that started that whole craze where I ended up with not one, but two backpacks. Well, you're solving a problem, you know, and you're doing it in the most efficient and eco-friendly way that you could think of. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> No. And you know, uh, there's always people saying, Hey, you know, I want to go backpacking, but I don't have a backpack or I don't have a sleeping bag because the sleeping bag is the other thing, you know, okay. They, they lose their effectiveness. They, you know, use their thermal effectiveness over time. But as I said, I have a down sleeping bag that's rated for 30 degrees, probably more like a 50 degree bag at this point. I'm not going to get rid of it. It just makes a good warm weather bag. Um, yeah. I think that does kind of make me also question like how do you know how long something is going to last because obviously it reached the end of its life in whatever its original purpose was in order to reach the point of being repurposed or like reimagined in your world and so do things tend to break down faster once they're repurposed or does that just kind of depend on the item it depends on the item uh my, but my sleeping bag, you know, to address that, when will I know I'm finished with that? I think when it's in shreds, when the feathers aren't kind of poking out, but they're pouring out, then I might say, okay, this is done. Uh, but for now, and if I have to, you know, I have a liner I bring with me to keep me a little warmer if I need to. Uh, as I said earlier, I have an outer bag that's rated for like 55 or 60 degrees. I've brought that in the cooler fall and spring uh, adventures. Yeah. I feel like for me, it also depends on how good of a job I do in making the new thing because, yeah. um, in like learning how to repair and repurpose stuff, I have made a lot of mistakes and <laughs> I probably would have been better off just like donating it or trying to recycle the materials or something like that. Um, well, that's but... a good point. And I've been there. I've been on that end of it. I tried learning how to sew and got frustrated very quickly. I didn't really give it much time. A friend of mine, the same friend that we raided that box they were throwing out at Cornell University Outdoor Education Program. He actually can sew, but I think it depends. Lots of, lots of times it depends on your skills, the quality of the gear you're starting with. If you're starting out with low end gear, you're probably not going to extend it much further by doing repairs on. So I think something you have to do, you have to assess, okay, so what did I pay for this originally? What was the original cost of it? Is the cost worth putting in the time and effort? Uh, I think sometimes we just need to be able to be able to say goodbye. Yeah. 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 And maybe if like you had your first tent was like an Ozark trail tent, I think that's like the Walmart brand and yeah. it does break down very fast, then maybe that would be a good time to learn how to sew because if you ruin it, like it was already ruined. And right. so you can maybe like try to make the stuff sack like you were talking about, or I have heard about people making um, like a footprint from the floor of a tent or, and those things don't take a lot of skill to do. And if you're going to throw it out anyway, that might be a good time to practice. Oh, tents are great for that. I've done that with tents. Yeah. I, when I see a tent ready to be tossed, I grab it up because I, I've made, like you said, footprints. All my footprints have always come from discarded tents, stuff sacks. I've made so many stuff sacks. And because that's an easy thing to do, I, I can sew, I can sew by hand. I can't use a sewing machine, but I've actually sewn stuff sacks by hand. And with my footprints, I don't have a hem on it. I just lay it on the ground, take a magic marker, cut it, and that's my footprint. And it probably works just fine. 
<laughs> it does. It co- it works as well as the, the ones that they sell you for like forty and fifty dollars, and and weighs less. Because mm-hmm. let's face it, that footprint. You, what is it doing? It's just protecting the bottom of your tent. Mm-hmm. It's it's not you know it it's not keeping you warm. It's not keeping you dry. It's not protecting you from anything. It's just so. Do you need to spend fifty dollars on a footprint for your tent? No. You find somebody who's and, and you're finding tents that are being discarded, contact the local outdoor group. Well, most colleges have outdoor education programs. They're looking at, always looking to offload stuff. The old tents, they could be found. And yeah, that's your best source for a footprint. Absolutely. I've even seen tents in dumpsters before. Um, and mm-hmm. you can just kind of like grab them out. Obviously you will want to clean them. So that is right. one thing that we could also talk about is maybe like when you're buying the used equipment, you said that the backpacks that you bought that were like two for $5 were pretty dirty and grimy. So can you talk a little bit about like the process you went through to kind of revive an old thing? Yeah, I knew there were stains that were never coming out, but I also knew that these backpacks were 20 or 30 years old. It was like, it is what it is, but the, there was loose dirt on there that could come off. So I took them off the frames and just put them through the, the washing machine. Now they probably lost some of their water resistant characters, characteristics by doing that. But I put a, I line my pack anyway, all the time. So I don't really, I'm not really that concerned about it. Cause I could see some of the, the, the membrane inside had come off when it went through the, the wash machine, but not a big concern. You can even spray it with the water resistant spray that you, people buy for their boots, new wax, stuff like that. So that that's all I did. And with the frame, I just took a piece of steel wool because it had some some pitting on it and from from laying around. And I just rubbed some steel wool over it, took a, a damp cloth, wiped that off over it. Doesn't look as good as new, but hey, I, it, it looks good for something that might be 30 years old. And it's functional, most importantly. I, I wouldn't be embarrassed to hand it to a friend and say, here, you can use this for the weekend. Yeah. It doesn't look like something I pulled out from under my house. It looks like something that's been taken care of, old, but taken care of. Yeah. It makes sense to clean like used products anytime that you buy them, or especially if you pull them out of the dumpster. Um, I'm a big fan of dumpster diving. So I do encourage people to do that when it's legal. (laughs) Um, But I'm sitting at a desk that was, that is the product of something pulled out of a dumpster. Okay, I took an old, uh, this is a different topic, but just quickly while we're on the topic of dumpster diving, this was an old sewing machine, one of those old wrought iron sewing machines. The cabinet of it was shot, peeling, the veneer was all falling apart on it. But I said, you know, I'm going to do something with that stand. I ended up making a good desk out of it. So yeah, I that's awesome. sometimes you just have to have an imagination. You have to, you know, use some imagination. How can I use that over again? How can that be repurposed? Yeah, it seems like in your life is really big, kind of like on the mindset sense of things. So then anytime you're kind of like looking at something kind of like another man's trash is another one's treasure, sort of attitude. Um, And so obviously, it fits into other areas of your life, too. So like furniture would be an example that you just gave us. But how else can repurposing kind of just like mesh into all areas of our life beyond recreation? Wow, I, you know, I garden tools. I see people ready to throw out garden tools. I'm like, all you need to do is put a new handle on it. All right. Instead of going out and spend $20, $30, whatever they cost at your local hardware store, put a new handle on it. A broken broomstick. Put that on there. It can be fastened on there. Uh, furniture. Oh, I look, I love finding a piece of furniture somebody was going to throw away and bringing it back to life and and some and see and even more rewarding is having somebody use it. Yeah, I just yeah, I think you know, and we've heard this term before. And you we may have I may have even talked about this when you were on my podcast. You know, we're, we're just a throwaway society. We're we're just, you know, that's it. We're done, just you know, throw it away, give me something new. And and we don't believe in number one, trying to extend the life of whether it's an appliance, a piece of furniture, or in this case, a piece of outdoor gear. Uh, we just, you know, it's broken. My washing machine broke. Instead of fixing it, get me the new shiny one, the new, you know, the newest one out there. And, you know, we're paying for that. And as I said, I grew up in a town where I watched the price we pay for that. I watched the garbage trucks pulling into the dumps when I probably should have been paying attention to, you know, something like English or <laughs> some some important, ge- I probably should have paid more attention to geometry instead of watching the garbage trucks go out in and out of the dump. But, uh you know, I saw the price we pay for being a throwaway society. And that was back in the 70s when it was, 
you, they were still making quality products that were lasting longer. And I think that that played a big role in, in my mindset of, you know, let's try to keep things from, from the, uh, from landfills. Yeah. It's easy to say, yeah, it's because I want to save money. I don't want to save money. I usually joke. I'm just cheap, but no, I think that it's ingrained in me that, you know, I, I've seen the scars. I've seen the damage of what we're doing when we just throw things in the garbage. So how do you think people can like apply more of that mindset then? Because we are so used to those single use items, or we do know that we can probably, sometimes it does cost less to buy something new than to have it repaired. So like, how can we kind of like overcome some of those barriers to reach that end goal? That's a good question. I've experienced that in my own household. Wash machines, a lot of times it costs less to buy a new wash machine. Uh, there's only, only so much we can do. We can control in that regard. Um, in that case, right? I can't manu I can't personally manufacture a better washing machine that's going to last longer. But something I know from growing up is that a better, more higher quality machine can be manufactured because they were at one time. So I think when it's something like an appliance, that's the best example I can come with right now, is maybe we can be putting pressure on these companies. Uh, maybe what we need to do is instead of running out and buying a new one, when we reach that point where my $500 washing machine is going to cost $600 to repair, say, okay, well, I'm just going to buy a used one. I always, I always like that idea first. I always, I always go to, okay, can we find something used? Maybe somebody's moving and there's another five plus years left in what they're selling. Yeah, kind of using the resources that you have at your disposal and like sourcing within the community, I think has been something that is really beneficial for me and something that has come up as you've talked about this, like, because you've got those backpacks on Facebook Marketplace, or you can go onto Craigslist or ask neighbors. And a lot of times you can find the things that you're looking for um, from someone in your neighborhood. Right. It's mutually beneficial person I bought the backpacks from, they were getting ready to move to Florida and they were at the point where, well, whatever's left, we're getting rid of. But instead they made $5 and I'm sure they felt better knowing that they were going somewhere where they were going to be used. They had memories attached to them. They, you know, there were attachments to those backpacks. The guy told me, I, my, my kids use these when we used to go out West and go backpacking. So there was a story with it too, which is kind of cool. That is cool. Right. Instead of just going to the store and buying it. Well, now there's a, there's a history attached to those backpacks that are now sitting in my closet that hopefully I'll be used eventually. Absolutely. We kind of talked a little bit about like kind of like the mental barriers of this process, but what about the physical barriers? So if someone hasn't repurposed anything before, what advice could you give them as to like how to get started? I would look at what's being sold out there to you first and always look at it in terms of can I make this? If you own a piece of gear, and here's another thing, here's where I got started with the stuff sacks. I remember just one day looking at this and said, looking at one and saying, you know, this cost, I think I paid $6 for it. And I thought, this is such a simple item. This is just some material sewn together with a piece of rope with a barrel closure on it. That's all it is. So, you know, why does it need to be fancy? If I'm using this to go backpacking, it just needs to be functional. So I would first tell people, Open up your imagination a little bit. Instead of seeing something that is going that, that is no longer of any use to you, that's going to be thrown in the garbage, use your imagination and look at it. Say, all right, it's got this outside pocket on it. Can that be used for something? Can I use it for something in the house? If uh, maybe you're into arts and arts and crafts, and you have it, have, you can say, all right, you know, I can I can store paintbrushes in that pocket. That'd be a good good storage place to put paintbrushes. Say, uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think outside of what you do outdoors wise as well. Of, of what you can repurpose things for. And then think of, as I said, you know, okay, buckles break all the time, straps, cut those off, get a, get a, I start off with just a little shoe box. I just kind of started tossing all that stuff in and it grew into something bigger. You, um, you know, and again, I don't, the, the first answer is, yeah, it'll save you money, but more importantly, far more importantly, and I mean this with all sincerity, you're stopping that from going to a landfill. Yeah, I think that that 
is definitely a motivator for a lot of people, but I did like that you started with the money aspect because I think that that can sometimes be a more immediate motivator yeah. um, for people. And it just so happens that they are both related and it's a positive outcome regardless. Um, because so, it's a price we pay when things go to the landfill mm -hmm. too. Our, our municipal taxes pay for that. We pay for it with our health because it hurts our environment. So yeah, there's a price tag attached to that as well. And, and you know, another thing is if you want to get motivated to do this, go look at the price of some of this gear, what they're charging for some of this stuff. Now I saw somebody who somebody I watch on YouTube who was, you know, and they had their, you know, affiliate marketing thing. And I'm not, you know, that's okay. I, I I get people wanting to make money. I like to make money, but this um container for cold soaking food, and for people who don't know what cold soaking is, sometimes backpackers will take their dehydrated food, put it in a container, add water and then let it soak for about an hour or so and just eat it cold. Well, they were selling this container. I looked it up. It was made of titanium. It was 90 something dollars. And I said, well, I've got my ice cream, my plastic ice cream containers that I use for that. You know, and I joke, I say, you know, this container costs $6 and it comes with free ice cream. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Right. It, what a bargain. Yeah. If it already works, then it's not broken because there are a lot of things that are uh, essentially just kind of like gimmicky or like flashy right. and they're not necessarily solving an immediate problem it's just like how can i make money off of this demographic of people and so like i feel like when you're repurposing gear and finding where it specifically fits into your life you're solving a problem that is immediate in your own life Whereas like people selling products to you, sometimes that's their motivation, but more often than not is how can I make money? Right. And as a backpacker, I mean, I've, I've used this phrase. I have said this and I don't have a problem coming out and say it. I think that since ultralight backpacking has become uh, more mainstream, it's being people are the people doing it are being exploited. And you have people that are just starting backpacking that are being told you need this equipment. Or if you want to be quote, one of the cool kids out on the trail, you need this piece of gear. And my feelings are, no, if you're a true ultralighter, you're also considering your wallet. You don't want your wallet to be part of your ultralight gear because you spent so much trying to, to buy all the cool stuff or all the shiny stuff they, they're telling you you need out there. Exactly. Awesome. Well, do you have any other, I guess, advice or even resources for listeners um, about repurposing or repairing outdoor equipment that you can think of off the top of your head? I'll share some resources in the show notes, but if you have any that you like. Yeah, I just, yeah, I don't have any websites or anything in particular to go to, but what I would say is this, if you're more patient than I am, if you have somebody in your life that knows how to use a sewing machine, learn how to sew. That's a skill I wish I had learned when I was younger, uh, my mother sewed, I probably should have learned how to sew instead of learned, learn how to bake. Okay. Um, they're both I, beneficial I, in different ways. They are, <laughs> they are, uh, learn how to sew if you can. And if you can't, don't be ashamed to ask people around you. If they sew, if you have friends or family, if, you know, that, that is, and, and go to them and help so, people, you'd be amazed how helpful people will become if they know you're trying to do something that's that's genuine, that's good, that's going to benefit you know, everybody. They'll, they'll become part of it and they'll want to help you. So that's number one. And there are websites out there where you can get patterns and 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 make your own gear. Uh, the other thing is become a treasure hunter. And what I mean by a treasure hunter is when you go into a one of these big box retail stores to to buy gear, sometimes they have bargain bins. Sometimes they have gear that was returned or broken. Go looking through there. See what you can pull out of there. I grew up not far from Campmore. Anybody that's familiar with Campmore. And they always had a box that was just return stuff, partial mess kits, you name it. It was in there. And I'd always go rummaging through there. Before I started going through this, before I'd walk through the store to buy something, I'd rummage through there to see what I can pull out of there and, and buy. That would be my my second bit of advice is yeah, go look for those bargains. Become a treasure hunter. When you go to yard sales, be looking around. Have, you have that eye looking. Where's that piece of gear? What's that thing? And not even let's let's extend this beyond backpacking in the outdoors. You know, where's that end table I can buy instead of buying a new one that I can just maybe sand it, polish it up, and and use it. Yeah, I love that. It also makes it a little bit more fun. 
I think. Oh, absolutely. And you know, it is, it's a lot of fun and it's very rewarding, you know, and if you haven't done it, maybe you can't relate to it, but yeah, when you've, and I use the word rescue something and you bring it back to life that, and this is the way I feel that I mean, these are my feelings. When I do this, you rescue it and you bring it back to life and, and you're using it. It's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Um, Awesome. Well, how can listeners learn more about you um, and your work, your podcast and your book? Well, my website is papabearhikes.com. And from there, you can click to all my social media because I'm not Papa Bear Hikes on all my social media. My YouTube channel is Martin Outside. I'll be starting a series on outdoor cooking for probably for a Yay. few weeks as I prepare <laughs> for my, my big adventure this year. And I'll get to that in a second. I'll be preparing all my food for that. And you can also find my book on on the website, it's Switching Gears. It's available on Amazon. You can go to the to the website, Papa Bear Hikes, and you can purchase it there, or just go to Amazon and Papa Bear Hikes. The name of the book is Switching Gears, and you can purchase it through uh, through Amazon. And uh, I think you're going to love the book. By the way, maybe I'm a little partial, but uh, <laughs> and yeah, that that's the that's that's pretty much. Those are the ways to really get. Get a hold of me and follow what I'm doing. My podcast, Papa Bear Hikes, is accessible on all platforms. So it doesn't matter if you have Spotify, iTunes, Pandora. I'm available on all of them. Listen, I do three episodes a week. I cover various topics. Meg has been on to talk about sustainable and minimalist. And, and we had a great conversation. And Meg, I'd love to have you back on and update us on some of the things you're working on. Uh, my podcast pretty much covers a variety of topics from backpacking, biking, and rock climbing. And yeah, so yeah, that's how you can find me. Awesome. I'll be sure to share all that information in the show notes too, so people can check it out really easily. Um, yeah, but with that, thank you for sharing all your great ideas. And I'm glad that we could finally reconnect and you could be on my show so I could host you this time. <laughs> Meg, it's been an honor. And, you know, as always, I enjoy talking to you. And it's just great that we can reconnect. It's really been, been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book or subscribe to our weekly newsletter at theoutdoorminimalist.com. For even more updates, educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with a shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.